Okay. And then so adding on to that, um, I'll be talking more about iconography later because that's really important. And this is really, really condensed, so please bear with me. So um, another important aspect of early Renaissance is by learning about the past, innovation started to become more prominent. So not only were artists taking elements from the past, but they were also using that as a base to create something more groundbreaking and more original. So this is really important in terms of Neoplatonism as well, which I will also talk about later. Okay, so we kind of covered the basis of Renaissance and humanism. Um, it's not exactly concrete. I would recommend looking through your notes and your book to really get a full understanding. This is just sort of a general um, idea of what you guys need to know as far as terms go. Um, in addition to that, there are three terms, um, or rather themes, that you're going to see a lot in uh, Renaissance, Europe, Northern Europe artwork, and that's going to be Annunciation, the Deposition, and the Nativity scenes. We all know what these are, you know, the Annunciation is being, you know, the announcement of uh, Mary being pregnant to Christ, Nativity scene is actually, you know, Jesus birth, and then Deposition is when Jesus is being um, taken down from the cross. You're going to see these themes everywhere, um, even some in the Italian Renaissance, but um, right now in our tests, like those are going to be the main focuses of Northern Europe. So that's really important as well. Um, and then we're also going to have to look at um, in terms of perspective, because linear perspective was invented um, by uh, Filippo Brunelleschi in 1420. So this was also really important uh, to understand that, you know, works before 1420 weren't very accurate as far as perspective goes. So you're going to have to know things like intuitive perspective, atmospheric perspective, orthogonal lines, vanishing point, vantage point, horizon line, and foreshortening. Now those are really, really important. So we already kind of know the general concept of what linear perspective is. We've all done it even in like elementary school. So orthogonal lines are just those invisible lines um, that converge into that point, which is the um, vanishing point. And then the vantage point is the viewer's point of view. So you're going to see this really prevalent in like Masaccio's Trinity piece. You're going to see that you're kind of at this weird position and same with Leonardo's The Last Supper. Um, your viewpoint is going to kind of be a little bit manipulated a bit and he did that on purpose. So just know that, just know that those are really prevalent. Another really prevalent thing is the horizon line. You're going to see that in uh, Francesca's painting. Um, and also within the Mona Lisa, amongst other things. Uh, just that horizon line is going to be really, really vital within the overall concept of the artwork. Foreshortening um, is really also important as well uh, in terms of uh, how they were manipulating the body. And you're going to see a lot more um, advantages to this in late Renaissance. Um, in early Renaissance, you're going to see um, more of like an experimentation with linear perspective. So like uh, Polalio's or Uccello's, excuse me, um, uh, painting the Battle of San Romano. You're going to see this weird foreshortening concept. You're going to see that kind of everywhere. But you're going to see it more later within the late Renaissance with uh, Michelangelo, especially. Um, just know that he tried really hard to influence his viewers in terms of his sculpting work. And it kind of ended up kind of falling down on him a lot. <laughs> so <clears throat> just know that those terms are really important. And then going back to iconography, um, this is really important in Northern Europe. This is where it was kind of invented. I mean, it's always been there within art, but this is this is why um, humanism is really important in uh, in Northern Europe was that iconography was just really important in terms of humanism there. So there's going to be weird uh, themes within specific objects. Uh, so for example, within the Moreau altarpiece, you see this like this little baby <laughs> like flying down from the window to Mary's stomach. And that's just like a really like discreet symbolism of, you know, her being pregnant with him, with Christ. And then you're going to see other things, other kind of uh, general ideas like white lilies being purity. And the actual theme itself with the Annunciation is iconography with an angel and a woman. You're generally going to understand that that's the Annunciation. When you see, you know, 
the virgin and the baby, like, around all these people, you're going to know that's kind of the nativity scene. The deposition is kind of obvious. The man come down from a cross, you know that's going to be Christ. And just those figures in general, like John the Baptist, uh, Mary Magdalene, and the virgin, like, those, those in itself is an iconography as well. And you're also going to see iconography in terms of Neoplatonism with pagan figures. Um, so, such as like Botticelli's uh, Birth of Venus and Primavera, you're going to see a lot of iconography there as well. But that's mostly in terms of a Neoplatonism. So going on, we're going to talk about oil painting now and its characteristics. Uh, oil painting was a huge, huge breakthrough in the Renaissance, particularly through um, Northern Europe, and that's where it was kind of... Um, like founded, I guess you can say. It was originally founded by Robert Campin, but he didn't really like go forward with it. Um, Jan van Eyck did. So just know that Jan van Eyck is really prevalent in terms of oil painting. So the characteristics of oil painting, um, for those of you that have taken a painting class and have used oil painting, you obviously know this. But for, for those of you that haven't, it's very saturated, very, very saturated as compared to fresco. I kind of compare the two. Fresco being more like, obviously it's water-based, so you kind of see it more as like a watercolor. Whereas with oils, it's more like out of the tube, saturated, just full blown out color. Manor Red Turban, you're going to see that saturated red with oil paint, but not with fresco. And also, the, good, the awesome thing about oil paints is you have this like versatile effect with it. So you can, uh, you can create thick or thin glazes. You can create texture, you can create warmth of the skin, you could create fur, that velvet texture of that red turban, um, and etc, etc. These are really breakthrough things that happened. And the most important thing was that oil painting took longer to dry. And this was amazing, especially for artists that felt like they had just a certain amount of time. Um, for those of you have, who have done fresco, you have really a certain amount of time to really complete an image depending on if you do al secco or buon, like wet or dry. But despite that, like fresco is just really hard to manipulate and it you have to like have a plan before you actually execute. Whereas with oil paint, you can manipulate with it. You can, you know, work with it as long as you want. You know, Leonardo worked on the Mona Lisa for a decade and he could because it was in oil. So that's really important to know. Um, in terms of Northern Europe, artwork again, you're going to find that a lot of them are in altar pieces. So just know what altar piece is. I don't really have to explain. It's kind of obvious. You're also going to know that these altar pieces are going to be in triptychs or polytychs. Now the way I kind of look at triptychs is, um, as Dr. Saylor said, it's kind of like, you know, when you were in the science fair and you had those like little billboard things and they were just those three panels. That's the same as a, like an altar piece, a triptych altar piece at least. It's just like these three panels hinged together to make an altarpiece, pretty much. So just understand those terms as well. Now we're going to go more towards uh, relief and printmaking process, because this was also a huge breakthrough in the early Renaissance. It was invented by Gutenberg in, I believe, 1450 in Germany. And so beforehand, like you had to handwrite all of the books, everything. So publishing was very difficult. And in fact, books were seen more as an art than actually as, you know, as a term of like, you know, you can read something for pleasure. It was arts and only the higher classes really had um, access to it. So the uh, Ecunabula uh, is the first Bible that's been printed. It's the Gutenberg Bible in other terms. Um, <clears throat> because what are they going to print out first when they find out that, you know, print the print press was invented? They're going to print out the Bible because that's the most useful um, book <clears throat> or manuscript there. So another thing is you're going to have to know um, two processes that the printmaking um, kind of went around, and that's intaglio and relief. Um, I don't think Dr. Saylor really wants to go into that much detail, but pretty much relief is kind of like a stamp. Um, and I know a lot of you probably took printmaking, so this is kind of obvious. So it's like a stamp, so where, like, you know, the protruding surface is the one being printed. Intaglio is kind of the offset where you engrave into a material. And those are really just general. There's more processes, but those are kind of the two main ones that you need to know. Um, the main important thing you need to know is the movable type printing press. <clears throat> and again, this was invented in around 1450 by Gutenberg. 
and it's a device that's for evenly printing onto a sub like a printing substance, so like paper or cloth. And this was a huge breakthrough again. Um, I cannot emphasize enough. This was a huge, huge thing in the Renaissance because that meant things could be published faster. Things could be accessible for the middle class and lower class. Literacy went up. Education went up because of this. Um, people from North started finding out about linear perspective that was invented in Italy because of this invention. This is really important and it also correlates with the act of humanism, again the potential for human beings, just going forward and understanding what your potential is, um, how far you can go. So this is really important too. <clears throat> So I'm going to switch to another video because it's about 10 minutes. Um, these are going to be kind of in short parts. So I'll be back to talk about sculpture processes and other terms.